Welcome again to the Onboard Week studio. Now we will broadcast interesting insights from our speakers, inspirational talks and discussions every day at 10 a.m. Central European time, this week from Monday to Friday. My name is Cyril van Hoof and I am the moderator of the Onboard Week 2020. Now the Onboard Week is an initiative of Apple, the company that provides a digital onboarding solution. And our goal with this event is to share knowledge on onboarding and to help you to create the most memorable onboarding experience. Now, in the networking sessions at the end of each day, apart from meeting the speakers, you will be also able to learn more about Apple's product, or you can just plan in a personal meeting with our onboarding experts, and you can do that through the link in the chat. Now, this program has been made possible by our partners, Yes, We Connect, great place to work, uh, HR Office, Validator Smart Recruiters, and Visma. Now, yesterday we spoke about uh, onboarding as part of an impactful employee's journey with Visma, Lightyear and Heineken. And today our speakers will explore the topic of pre-boarding. We will learn about the importance of making a connection before your hire's first day from Epical. We will get data-driven insights into employee behavior and decision-making from Microsoft. And we will learn how to use pre-boarding as a tool for retention from smart recruiters. Now I want to welcome our speakers at the table. Henk Ritmeester from Microsoft. Good morning. Good morning. Peter Straatsma from Apple. Good morning. And live on the webcam, Tony de Graaf from Smart Recruiters. Good morning, Tony. You morning. hear us? Hi. Now let's start with the introductions. And Tony, let's begin with you. Because tell us, why couldn't you make it to our fabulous studio? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I am Dutch, right? But uh, I'm located in Berlin. So with all the new uh, restrictions, I was not so free to travel to the Netherlands, unfortunately. So um, here digitally. Yeah, now we're happy that you're here, that you can, t can attend. So um, I want to start with an icebreaker first with you. Um, what crazy activities do you dream of trying someday? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, for me, I think that we'll be living on a farm and trying to make wine in Italy one day with, together with my wife. That would be amazing. Yeah, that's really cool. And where in Italy? Um, well, I think somewhere in the Chianti area, so between Florence and uh, Siena, getting lost in Tuscany somewhere. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. But what do you mean? You want to become a winemaker or you just want to live on a vineyard? Because that's a big difference there, eh? <laughs> well, yeah, this is what I meant with trying to make wine, right? So okay. that would be great, or I am any good at it, I don't know, but let's see. <laughs> yeah. Now, I have a favorite Italian wine, that's a Barolo. What's yours? Hmm. Uh, for me, it's uh, Brunello. Brunello, okay, great. Now, it's a good dream to work towards. Yes, definitely. Yeah, for the audience, we have a little delay here, so <laughs> just a small one. Um, your company name is Smart Recruiters, but what do you do that is so smart for recruiters? <laughs> yeah, really good question. Yeah, I think that has to do a little bit with our philosophy, right? So we uh, really focus on providing a complete talent acquisition suite, but um, we understand that the suite is not just for recruiters. Everyone should work in it. So everyone is a, a member of the smart recruiters ecosystem. So including hiring managers, interviewers, everyone. Um, and I think it's very important for us that we uh, keep investing in helping our customers become successful in recruitment. So not just setting you up in a technology, but uh, uh, help you along the journey as well. Okay, and smart recruiters have their own successful events called uh, Hiring Success. Can you give one big tip how, how you achieve that? How to achieve that? Yeah, good question. Um, 
I think that's a, we can we can do a, an entire uh, episode or just around achieving hiring success, I guess. But I think the key takeaway there is that um, achieving re- becoming successful in recruitment for your organization is not specifically implementing a great ATS or doing a few separate things, right? It's you need to understand um, how every little aspect of talent acquisition um, um, adds up to the bigger whole and uh, how everything contributes to what you want to achieve and constantly working on uh, on this and having the view, the overall view of this, this is how you should work towards hiring success. So not just specifically say, hey, we implemented a new ATS or implemented a new app and now we are successful. No, 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 no. Okay. It's all those little pieces together. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tony, uh, for now, at least. Um, Hank, we would like to get to know you also a little bit better. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, what is your idea of fun? Ooh. <laughs> my idea of fun is climbing to the top of a mountain with a parachute on my back and then run off and uh, start flying. Ooh, what yeah. a daredevil you yeah, are. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, and I looked on uh, LinkedIn and I saw... I did too. Yeah, you did too. Yes. <laughs> what did you see? <laughs> I did see that you love singing. Yeah, I do. I am a presentation coach, but I have uh, also like more than 20 years experience uh, with singing. I would say one song? <laughs> yeah, one oh, no. song. <laughs> I knew that you almost asked me. <laughs> oh, I'm not prepared because normally you have to warm up your voice. Mm. But shall I do it? Tony, you agree on it? Shall I sing just really short? It does. Ah, um, no, something that I would sing when I wake up. Okay? Cool. When I wake up in the morning, I'm giving thanks, giving praise. I'm giving love because it's given me another day. I got peace deep in my soul. I got love making you home. Since you open up your heart and shine on me. Yes. Wow. Here we go. I just gave myself yeah. applause. <laughs> this is our applause button, Tony. So uh, we don't have an audience, so we need a little bit interaction and this some was fun. Yeah. <laughs> but let's turn it around again because we were talking about you. Yeah. And what I saw on LinkedIn is that you are, are a fanatic with numbers, data, statistics, analytics. Oh my God, I'm jealous because I'm totally not like that. And. Um, Could you tell us some metrics about the changes happening in the workplace because of the pandemic? Yeah, we can. So, um, where to start? I think if I have to mention a few things that really stood out is we started since working from home to focus much more on the people we need to be successful in the role. Mm -hmm. So what we see is we collaborate with less people, but the people we collaborate with, uh, we collaborate much more with. What we do see is that large meetings are down with 22%, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, 11% numbers. Oh. And we do see that short meetings are up with uh, 22%. Um, and in the end, I'll rehearse this, but what we absolutely see is the importance of the role of a manager, uh, specifically during onboarding. So I will uh, tap into that. And we already know that a manager can make a difference with uh, 67% uh, on do I have fun in my first 90 days? Uh, will that increase my time to stay? Mm-hmm. And if the manager plays the role good, that will increase the intent to stay even after four years with 8%. Wow. So that's huge. Yeah, it's yeah. really huge. Yeah. I see Tony nodding. <laughs> yeah, he agrees yeah. as well. <laughs> and what did you bring for us to the table today? So what I will talk about basically is um, we're in a new phase, whether we like it or not, where uh, the way we work is uh, changing like crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, We will not go back to uh, normal. And what is hard is that we, of course, all have opinions on, uh, hey, what's happening? Uh, But the problem with opinions is it's not fact-based. You can interpret that it's uh, completely different. So what I will bring to the table today is more insights on what is the data that we really have available to determine what is working, what is not working, and then based on facts, start working. So I love the saying, hey, what you had, it's translated from Dutch, but what you find you should bring to the police Mm -hmm. uh, and what you should bring to the table is facts. Wow. I'm really curious to your presentation later on. You're welcome. Yeah. 
Nou, I don't die, think. Hè? I don't think. I'll <laughs> not ask. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Uh. <laughs> yeah, who knows later. Uh, Peter, I also have Morning. a few questions for you, of course. Um, what two things do you consider yourself to be very good at? Oh, that's a very bold question to say that about yourself. But um, uh, I would say, firstly, storytelling, uh, example. Um, when I take my kids to bed, mm -hmm. it will take me a few minutes before they fall asleep. Um, probably because the story is super boring, but I'm happy with the result, <laughs> right? So uh, I count my blessings there. Um, secondly, I would say the people that know me, I'm, I'm a positive guy. I like to uh, think in opportunities and uh, take, take the most of every day. Um, and also try to well, spread that energy to my team and, mm -hmm. and to my kids. Yeah. So just be positive is something I, I like to do and I hopefully uh, am also good at it. Yeah. Now you sound like an amazing dad. Good for Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I have to ask my kids, but uh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what is your role at Apple, and how long have you been working there? Um, I am with the company for a little bit over six and a half years now. Um, I hold the, the title of CCO, which means something else in Apple than probably with uh, within Mar uh, Microsoft or smart recruiters. Mm -hmm. But um, um, as an example, when I joined Apple, we were with a handful of people operating from a small office in Amsterdam North, five, six people. Um, when I picked up the phone and uh, asked for the person responsible for onboarding, uh, the, the person behind the receptionist said, well, that's me. Um, or the hiring manager was the person currently, six years later, uh, with my team. Uh, I think we don't have to explain the, the definition of onboarding anymore. We can just um, dive into the, to the solution and what we can add for value. So, um, currently, I am, um, um, well, I wouldn't say conquering the world with the team, but mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm building the company uh, every day. Okay. And uh, can you tell us a little bit more why Apple organized Onboard Week? Definitely. I, I, I have to travel back in time to uh, 2017, where mm -hmm. back then we, uh, we were already for, for five years in business. Um, like I mentioned, um, telling the world about onboarding. And at some point we said, um, let's become a thought leader. I still yeah. remember. Um, and somebody said, yeah, we have to triple our marketing budget, right? To become a thought leader. Um, present on more uh, conferences, be more, uh, more speakers on sessions like this. Um, but I don't think that makes you a, a thought leader, right? So uh, after some brainstorming, we said, um, what if we could, um, could organize a platform where like-minded people uh, that's struggling with, with topics like onboarding mm -hmm. or pre-boarding, something we will discuss today, um, and we could bring them all together and have industry leaders uh, sharing their experience, like Microsoft, but also Heineken, Booking.com. Over the last few years, we had many speakers um, and share their experience. And after that, we could, uh, could network. Um, of course, powered by Apple as today, but not, not from a, a sales perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I still remember our, our goal was to have 200 people uh, in one room. Uh, it ended up with more than 400. And since then, it, it doubled every year. Uh, and this year, of course, with Corona, we said, uh, on-site event isn't isn't happening anymore, but we we did a survey to our network like would you still have a session of a conference like this? And the response was uh, huge like yes, yeah. yes, please, but not about onboarding only but also about pre-boarding about cross-boarding about off-boarding So uh, long story short, we said let's do it in a full week every morning. Yeah. have more speakers more topics So so yeah, uh, yeah. Here we are yeah, and I have to add something to it because the Apple's team is really great. Thank you. They're very professional and made such a great event. And I love all the people who are in the team. I couldn't so agree I'm more. I'm also happy to be part of this. Definitely. Event. We're happy with you uh, hosting this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Peter. So today's topic is pre-boarding, and in the preparation sessions we found out that there are still a lot of organizations out there that start onboarding activities on the first working day of the new hire. Now today's speakers will try to convince you to bridge the gap between recruit recruitment and the first day on the new job. So let's find out at our audience how you are doing on this topic, so please fill out this poll and we will include the end results at the final discussion here at the table. So let's have a quick discussion with you guys here about this topic. Um, Tony, what is pre-boarding? <laughs> oh. oh. Pre-boarding? Yeah, yeah. pre-boarding for me is uh, actually yes to desk, right? So that moment when somebody says yes and um, uh, to your offer literally until the first day. So including all the paperwork uh, that needs to be done, administrating, creating accounts, uh, 
learning uh, already a little bit in the in that beginning but all the activities until the first first day that's for me pre-boarding yeah and um peter why is pre-boarding so important in the onboarding process <coughs> Well, I think it's the, the most important and most exciting part of the journey, right? Um, so, so it can be either the, 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 the phase where you turn your new hire already an ambassador, mm -hmm. but the other side is also possible, right? Where you can lose your, your talent or maybe disengage them. Uh, so I think this phase, pre-boring, like Tony said, from yes to desk is the moment where you can either shine or, or potentially lose your talent um, uh, after day one. So it's, it's, it's ultimately uh, the phase where you make uh, things happen. Yeah. What do you think? <sighs> hey? I think it's, it, the most important thing is to tap into the excitement. Uh, I started eight months ago at Microsoft and I still remember the day I said yes. Uh, <laughs> and then you want to celebrate with your network, but you want to you wanna start embracing, hey, what did I do? Yeah. And due to the fact that between the moment till you say yes, till the first day, there's mm -hmm. a lot of, well, there's uncertainty. Uh, hey, will it, will it be like I was expecting? How will my colleagues be? Yeah. Um, do I have the knowledge? Will I be able to, to contribute from the start? Mm -hmm. And the sooner the organization can tap and make you part of how do we work? What is the culture? Is mm -hmm. helping me to, to confirm to me constantly I made the right choice even before starting? I think that's the first thing. Second thing is you have so much to learn from the first day. Why not start with that the moment I'm already yeah. interested and engaged? Uh, and that is the moment I said yes. Yeah. yeah. I think if you compare it with uh, with booking your flight for a holiday, which is of course nowadays uh, probably not happening that often, but uh, <laughs> you do some desk research, right? Where to go, Italy or or uh, skydiving somewhere, um, and, and then you make a decision. And in that phase, before you uh, jump on that plane or jump in the car, uh, you start talking with your family, friends about it, right? Uh, you're excited, you're high in your energy, and then you arrive at your destination and. It better be the same as, uh, as the website told you, right? Yeah. So it's very important to, uh, to get that expectation right. Yeah. And what negative consequences can not having a good onboarding in place lead to, Peter? Well, I think partly, that, like, like I just described, I think if that expectation is different, for instance, if that hotel room or a swimming pool doesn't look that good, or mm -hmm. your, um, um, the promise in the, in the pre-hiring, pre right, in the recruitment phase, is not the same as, as the reality is. It can be a huge um, well, disappointment. And mm -hmm. I think in the, in the first 30 days, up to the first 60 days, uh, um, employees make uh, the decision to stay for a long time, like, like um, Hank said, for already eight, eight months now, or leave uh, within the first, uh, first months. So it's very important to, to set the right expectation, to not lose them uh, along the way. Yeah. Somebody wants to add something to it? No. Uh, again, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that's right. Um, then let's start with the presentations. And Hank, you start off by talking about fact-based decision-making and how data show a big shift in employee behavior. So surprise us, take the presenter stage and uh, prepare yourself. And we would like to invite you sitting at home to ask any questions you, you get uh, while watching the presentations, and you can write them down in the Q&A part in the link. Stay tuned till the end of the session where the questions will be answered by our speakers. Now, good luck, Hank. <laughs> <laughs> So, good morning again, and uh, nice to be able to talk to you about, uh, hey, what kind of analytics do we have available? And to explain a bit more about the, the way we can offer this, uh, Microsoft is offering basically two products uh, called uh, My Analytics and Workplace Analytics. If I look into Workplace, uh, sorry, if I look into My Analytics, My Analytics is a tool that we provide to individual employees and individual employees only to make them aware of how I work. And awareness is basically the first start, of course, to start acting on, hey, I didn't know I was doing ABC, now I know, am I happy with it, or do I wanna change my behavior? My analytics is basically zooming in on things like, how am I um, uh, scheduling my calendar? How much time do I have for collaboration? How much time do I have to network internally, but also externally? How much time do you have to focus? Um, uh, meaning I can even zoom in on the balance in uh, my well-being. If I provide individuals, uh, individual employees with insights on their uh, well-being and how they can change behavior, uh, it's important to realize that as an employee, I'm not on my own. I'm part of a team, I'm part of a wider organization. 
So it would be good if I can be fueled with data that helps me if I look at myself and then at the same time look at what's happening in my team, how can I combine those two things? And that's basically where workplace analytics starts to come in. So with workplace analytics, we allow organizations to look at trends. So it's not a controlling or a monitoring tool, but we allow them to look at trends on what's happening in teams, what's happening in the way people behave, etc. And as you can imagine, with the start of COVID-19, whether we like it or not, we are entering uh, or in the midst of a phase that is a huge experiment where we are uh, trying to find out what is working, what is not working while working from home. And in that whole phase of finding out what is working and what is not working, it's really important to have data available that tells me what actually is happening. And again, while working from home, uh, we're trying to adapt ASAP to, uh, to this new way of working. But that also means there's a lot of unawareness of how I actually behave. There's unawareness of why certain teams are doing a great job or why certain teams are, uh, are probably doing a lesser job. And also with regards to onboarding, a huge change happened uh, because, um, again, I started at Microsoft per 1st of February, so I was in the lucky position to at least have one month of physical onboarding. But after that one month, of course, everything changed to completely onboarding, working from home, doing the e-learnings, getting to know my colleagues, starting to connect with new clients, and that all happened online. And you, as an organization, of course, want to know, hey, what are the trends? What is working? What is not working? Et cetera, et cetera. So if we then look at how we used to uh, measure employee experience, uh, I'm an HR professional myself, and if I look in the past, basically we had three tools available. One, of course, is the uh, engagement survey, uh, in Dutch, het medewerker tevredenheidsonderzoek, where we dive into, hey, what's the opinion of employees on uh, how they work and perform at a company? If attrition is high, we uh, tend to perform exit interviews to learn from, hey, why are people leaving and uh, where can we improve? And of course, if we have uh, enough uh, new hires, we start with surveys to learn from their experiences. What I realized the moment I uh, uh, got to know workplace analytics is that with all those surveys, we're basically tapping into what's top of mind with me over the face you're asking me questions about. So if I zoom in on onboarding, of course, after six months, I got this interview on, hey, Hank, how did you experience your onboarding? And I'm immediately thinking back six months back on, during those six months, uh, what stood out for me, what worked really well, and at the same time, I'm thinking about, hey, what is the kind of constructive feedback that I can provide? But what struck me, again, is all the things I'm not aware of, all the things I can't influence, those are not the things I'm mentioning. So what I will do with you is zoom in on, hey, what is workplace analytics and how can that enrich basically what we do with this surveying? Because, and keep this in mind, I'm not saying that workplace analytics should replace something like uh, surveys. I think the combination is in what if we can start analyzing what's happening and then ask our employees on, hey, we noticed ABC and what do you see uh, and think about that trend? Very quickly, if we dive into workplace analytics, what is it doing? It's stepping into the metadata of Outlook Calendar, Outlook Email, uh, Teams, and if you're, it's in the cloud, we can also do that for Skype. And if I talk about metadata, that means we're only zooming in on the header of emails or appointments, and we're zooming in on the people involved. We're not reading emails, we're not reading the content of a calendar invite, we're not reading uh, the Teams chat, so no worries there. And the second thing is the power of analytics lies in the amount of data. So I'm not interested in what's happening with the four people in this room uh, presenting. I'm interested in what's happening in the wider organization, in all those meetings that we attend, in all those chats that we have, etc. And then we ask organizations to upload some organizational context to make sure that we can report basically based on their organizational structure, etc. Make sense so far? Yeah, cool, check. So if we then zoom in on, hey, what's happening if we add that data to, for example, onboarding, you already see some touch points on the screen on the left side. So where with an onboarding interview, I can zoom in on my experiences. With uh, workplace analytics, I literally can start measure, hey, Hank, when you started, when did you first meet the team? How soon did you have your first one-on-one -on -one with your manager? And then following that, how structured did your manager continue with following up on uh, uh, having meetings? 
I can see how soon I entered my first team meeting, how soon I entered uh, first project meetings. I can see how fast new hires are growing their network internally, but also externally. I can see how soon they did start uh, meeting clients. And again, what Workplace Analytics is not showing how Hank did, but what Workplace Analytics is showing if we look at the amount of new hires in the past quarter, let's say 20, 25, 50, what is the trend that is happening with onboarding? If an organization is interested in uh, learning more, they can even add more attributes to workplace analytics, for example, to start identifying, do we see differences in regions with regards to onboarding? Or do we see differences between males and females onboarding in our organization? So there's a lot of stuff that we can uh, look at. In addition to that, there's also stuff that I, as an onboardee, can't influence, and that's the role of my manager. So looking into the manager, based on studying, we know that new hires are um, uh, building their network internally much faster if the manager, him or herself, has a large network as well. We also do know that a new hire is allowed to be more creative if the manager is more connected into leadership. And if you start thinking about it, there's a very simple reason for that. If I, as a manager, have a new hire and I'm well connected to my uh, colleagues in the organization and also into leadership, it's easy for me to, me to say, hey, new hire, do your thing, be creative, bring up your new ideas. And hey, if the new hire is making a mistake or is doing something that is not a fit with our culture, I can easily correct not only the new hire, but also the perception around me. If I, as a manager, have a very limited network and have to manage, my, manage the perception of my team carefully while having limited moments to do so, it's much more likely that it will say to my new hire, come up with your new ideas, bring them to me, and then I will decide how we will uh, bring them into the organization and in what way. While having the best intention, this manager is probably not realizing that he or she is immediately flattening down the creativity, the innovation, uh, the new perspectives that a new hire is bringing in. And if I add that to research, and again, that will be in the slides sent to you afterwards as well, what we do know is the more a manager is spending time with his or her onboardee, the more he or she is helping the new hire to get connected into the organization, the sooner this new hire will feel I'm in meetings that are contributing and that I experience as meetings of high quality. This new hire will much sooner become productive because he or she is building the network that he or he, she needs to be uh, productive and uh, show off. So that's, that's a great advantage. Then, um, thanks to Workplace Analytics, we're capable to analyze, hey, since the start of COVID-19, what's happening with business continuity. So we can see how uh, many people started to um, make more uh, uh, hours after uh, the regular working hours how many people started working during the weekend, how many of our employees are burdened with email, chats, etc. And at the same time, where do we see teams that become uh, isolated? Because we see a decrease in the amount of hours working or a decrease in the amount of uh, time spent on collaboration. So I'm just clicking very quickly through some slides that give you some impression on, hey, what basically is it that we can do? And then again, uh, summarizing, and then I will come to an end. If we look at, um, hey, has some use cases that we have done to improve onboarding, to boost engagement and reduce uh, attrition, what we do see, and I, I can't emphasize that enough, is the importance of the role of a manager. We do know that if a manager is having enough one-on-ones in the first 90 days, uh, the new hire will have a 12 percent larger network in the first 90 days and at the same time we'll have two times more centrality so basically much more focused on what's happening he or she will experience 20 plus more hours with regards to hey i experienced those meetings as really qualitative uh, and great meetings and if we zoom in we even see that eight percent of new hires have an uh, uh, a higher intent to stay uh, on measure so, while I will be uh, available after this, because I can imagine that there's a lot of questions on how do you collect the data and what does that mean for our organization? Can I do this too? What do I have to keep in mind when starting to collect this uh, uh, information? I will be available in the network session to address all those questions. And even if you have questions with regards to privacy or whatsoever, we absolutely can address them uh, because we did spend quite some time in how do we prevent this tool from becoming a big brother? And how can we make 100% sure, both from the perspective of a company as well as the employee, that this is data that is serving you instead of monitoring and controlling you? Cyril.
back to you. And a big applause for you, Eng. Yeah, that was really, really, really interesting. I have actually immediately a first up follow follow up question to you. Yeah. Um, what about the privacy of the user? And can people <laughs> trick the system? Well, a <laughs> yeah, you're also curious about that. Yeah, there, there's yeah. there's a lot to discuss about this, and yeah. it's always the uh, elephant in the room. So. Um, what I loved in the in the past eight months is there's a uh, within Microsoft the huge slogan that says hey Microsoft runs on trust and when they say it they really mean it so mm -hmm. there's no fooling around so I can start talking a about the fact that um, uh, again we're not zooming in on small pieces of data but we're zooming in on huge amounts of data mm -hmm. basically making sure that we present only on trends but hey that sounds fluffy right so mm -hmm. let's make that much more specific. <laughs> We a uh, don't allow organizations to zoom in on groups smaller than five. Okay. At the same time, if you have a feeling, for example, as a working council, hey, I love this data, but a group of five that with a farmer's mind, I still have the logical feeling that uh, we can identify that. We have tooling in place that uh, where we can say, okay, if an organization wants to commit to a higher aggregation level at minimum, we can do that. Mm -hmm. B, we advise organizations to start thinking with uh, about workplace analytics on use cases. So don't just use it, but agree with your working council on what is the kind of use cases that we want to zoom in on. So for example, how are we doing with onboarding? How are we doing with employee experience? How are we doing with regards to the risk of teams becoming isolated, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. Then we have some techniques in place. So we have a technique in place that we call differential privacy. That's a technique that we developed together with Harvard. And differential privacy basically is a technique where we say, if we identify the smallest risk of, um, hey, if an organization is running this report, they might be able to identify an individual. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm explaining it in, in storytelling, so <laughs> uh, we, we can all document this uh, mm -hmm. more specifically. But then we basically add enough noise to the data that we present, to the reporting, to make 100% sure, again, I can't see that Cyril has been doing ABC. But while adding this noise, we at the same time can guarantee 100% that it's not impacting the outcome of the analysis. Mm -hmm. And again, what we are interested in is not to analyze how was Tony doing from Berlin and was he, during my presentation, engaged and listening in, yes or no. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested in is when Hank is presenting over time, and Hank is allowing us to analyze that, if we look at the large groups of people that are joining his presentations, how did he do on average? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where did people uh, start to tune in? Where did they uh, start to check out? Because that is helping us to improve. Yeah. So the whole focus is around that. Yeah. Then, and that, then I will quit. Uh, <laughs> no, but but, pri continue. but <laughs> privacy is really important. Um, so we have this differential privacy uh, thing. The second thing is, Workplace analytics pulls data from, uh, it's becoming technical now, but from the tenant, so the server of an organization. Mm -hmm. And before even doing anything with the data, we're de-identifying all the data points that we have, then start building reports, and those reports basically are uh, uh, presented then, de-identified, so without any correlation or relation to the individuals. And then I can spoke about, speak about the roles we implemented in Workplace Analytics to make sure that the analysts that are running reports um, uh, are skilled and capable to do so, but are also limited, so the organization can control who is reporting, mm -hmm. and um, only professionals are allowed to interpret uh, what's happening in the data. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, we are making it possible for organizations to literally log every uh, um, uh, way an analyst is using the data out of Workplace mm -hmm. Analytics, and we're capable of, of giving those log files back to a working council if agreed on that. Yeah. So privacy, yes, is indeed important. Yeah. Funny enough, and again, then I... Uh, you can feel a whole day, I think, Yeah, but the, the, the fun yeah. part is, um, uh, 15 years ago, yeah. I think it is now, that we started with uh, engagement surveys, eh? again, yeah. the medewerkers to vredeids onderzoeken in, in Dutch. <laughs> And I still remember that working council were, were grilling me like, Hank, uh, it sounds amazing that you start questioning employees, but we don't trust the fact that it will be anonymous and mm. yeah. the board will be able to read it. And how soon will they start to point out where people are, are negative? Mm -hmm. and mm. What about the manager that can't stand any feedback? Mm. And I think we've, we've proved as organizations together in the past 15 years how valuable engagement surveys are. Yeah. 
And I have the feeling, and that's a fun feeling, that we're at the same start with workplace analytics. We need to prove to our employees yeah. we are going to use data in your benefit yeah. instead uh, of from agree. the perspective of controlling. I agree. Yeah. I, I find it very interesting, uh, Henk. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and I think uh, a key takeaway that the manager's involvement is is, is fundamental, right? Um, but, but we see that also other stakeholders, right, in the journey and the success, like the peers, the... The, the, the hiring manager, um, HR, of course, uh, are very important. Does the data say anything about other stakeholders than the manager um, that are, are, are very important for the success? Well, what is fair to say is that with regards to onboarding, we, we haven't built the use cases to analyze that deeper. So um, um, if I just look into the data points that we have available, yes, I can immediately see is there a buddy involved yeah, uh, yeah, in buddies. onboarding. Yeah. I can see what is the amount of touch points uh, that new hires had within uh, teams. Yeah. But the coolness of workplace analytics, again, is not just zooming in on one team. It starts to compare to see what are the best practices. Check. Yeah. So if the question is, hey, we have seen some teams that are amazing in doing onboarding. Mm. Yes, we can analyze how soon did colleagues start to reach out, uh, right. at what moments, in yeah. what ways, in what kind of meetings, how active were they in chatting, compared to teams where that's not happening. Very powerful. And the thing I like the most about workplace analytics so far is it's immediately moving all easy assumptions out of the way. Yeah. So even uh, myself, I've seen uh, quite often when I got reporting, hey, uh, managers are not performing their one-on-one -on -one with the employees, the first reflex is, oh, that's a bad manager. <laughs> but then if you start analyzing what is that manager doing, for example, since the start of COVID-19, we, within Microsoft, realized that since the start of COVID-19, we were asking our managers to report back much more on what's the status quo, how are we doing, how are we still capable to stay in touch with other teams and yeah. stay in touch with clients, etc., etc. So we pulled them in much more meetings to report back, mm -hmm. and then we were surprised that they didn't have time to have one-on-one -on -one with employees. <laughs> so Makes sense. the coolness with data is that it's basically confirming us on the fact that the intent of people is not wrong, Okay, People yeah. are not Netflixing at home while gotcha. working from home, no. but it's, hey, how? what is the, the set of tasks that we provide them, and yeah. we then empower them to set the right priorities. Yeah, makes so sense. Yeah. I think yeah. data was al always king, but I think in, in times like this, data mm -hmm. is even more important, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Cool. And, and Tony, what were the most interesting statistics you heard from Hank that impressed you? <laughs> To involve well, uh, you also in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's with, with the delay, I don't want to uh, mess up the flow of the conversation too much. But um, again, the hiring manager uh, thing stood out for me. Um, and maybe, Hank, um, it's interesting to see that um, if I, in my experience, this best practice and involvement around hiring managers during this pre and onboarding phase a lot of organizations don't really specifically have a process for this in place, but do you see um, in the data some trends emerging on what could potentially be best practice in the engagement of hiring managers? What, the how, when, how much, etc. Or is it too early for that? Well, um, um, the, 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 the fun here is I can't really answer that question and I'll explain why. The data that we are analyzing is data of organizations. So they own it and we're not looking into that data. So we're not looking at all at, uh, hey, how can we combine the data of organizations to predict on trends, mm. unless organizations commit themselves on, hey, Microsoft, can you run those kind of analysis? So um, I can't speak for, hey, what's happening uh, uh, on trends there worldwide. Um, and again, we advise organizations basically to connect to each other when they start using workplace analytics to start exchanging, hey, what did you see in your organization? But it's up to them to, to decide on that. So I can't really answer that question in, uh, in that, uh, Tony. Maybe an additional question then. Uh, I assume Microsoft is using the tool uh, for their own uh, Definitely. people. Is there anything yes, you can share? You. Anything you can share since it is about Microsoft? Or yes, also? I can. Yeah? So, um, um, if you go to uh, insights.office.com, you can, you can read about quite some use cases. Cool. And the fun is that Microsoft the Netherlands did run an experiment like we are in now, mm -hmm. uh, three years ago, where we decided, hey, we uh, uh, want to redecorate uh, a, a new office, and that should be a fit towards the future of working. Yeah. And the, uh, the country manager of the Netherlands decided hey, to, to really see how that works. I'm closing the office for 10 weeks. And during those 10 weeks, we tell employees, 
do your job wherever you like. So whether that's from home, from it's a restaurant. It's pre-corona, right? Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. okay. So three years ago. Yeah, nice. And we had, uh, and he basically said, hey, uh, find out, we trust you in the way that you will still perform your job and try to find out what is working for you. Yeah. And while doing that, they um, uh, did get permission, of course, to analyze, hey, how are people collaborating, mm -hmm. with whom are they collaborating, mm -hmm. etc., to be able to identify with the new redecoration of the office, yeah. should we position, like always, all finance professionals together and all ITers together, etc., yeah. or can we identify which ITer is working with what, yeah, what financial, yeah. and then how can we use the data to redecorate the office? Check. Nice. That kind of analysis was helping us big time these days. So based on, on uh, that experiment three years ago, we developed, and that was the reason I was referring to that hyperlink, we developed mm -hmm. something that we call the Microsoft Rituals. And the Microsoft Rituals are telling us, um, um, A, we respect focus time. So the mm -hmm. moment we see focus time in the calendar, yeah. I'm not <laughs> reaching out to a colleague, I'm not chatting with a colleague if I see he's in or her, his or her focus yeah. time. Yeah. Well, the normal reflex is how someone is free, so yeah, I can yeah, disturb, yeah, right? So smart. you don't do that. Secondly, we show up at meetings. We show up at meetings on time, uh, and that's very important. Mm. Very we <laughs> have we have a calendar in the uh, so a prep in the in the meeting invite. Yeah. Um, we have things like we end uh, ten minutes before uh, online meetings. Suggestion right. is schedule them for fifty minutes, so mm -hmm. you have ten okay. minutes left. Even when the meeting is extended with five minutes, you can yeah. still have your hygiene break yeah. and check out. And with the Working Council in the Netherlands, we agreed let's use workplace analytics to measure the status quo of those rituals. Yeah. So again, there was a very clear use case where we used this data. Yeah. And it was amazing to see that the moment we started working together on, hey, we respect each other's focus time, we're also focusing on having meetings, eh, for example, with certain teams in the morning instead of in the afternoon. Yeah that productivity increased, yeah. but more importantly, engagement and well-being of employees increased heavily as well. Yeah, very important. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay, thank you. You're um, welcome. Tony, you prepared for us as well a talk eh? <laughs> on how to use pre-boarding as a tool yeah. for retention. So once again, for the audience, don't hesitate to ask any questions in the chat, and our speakers will answer them at the end of this session. I would say, Tony, go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I think you guys need to share my presentation. Yes, there we go. I can see it right now. That's, that's perfect. Thank you very much. So yes, yes to desk actually. So how um, how can pre-boarding actually drive retention? And let me start immediately with um, what I think is the key takeaway. And that is do not approach pre-boarding as just an internal process, but as an experience for your new hire, right? And I think that's already kind of the red thread that is uh, coming, uh, coming to light here at the table discussion. Um, because yes, this is the first moment you need to start delivering on your promises that you've made, right? And yes, we all know, first impressions do matter. So the goal for me today is to give you some food for thought and uh, inspire you on the topic of uh, pre-boarding. And how I would like to do that is by explaining how we for as smart recruiters approach talent acquisition and from here give and share a few new ideas on uh, the experiences and best practices that we uh, that we come across in the industry of working with our customers so who are we we are smart recruiters um, hiring success company yes we are a software company and a talent acquisition suite but our overall goal is to help TA teams to become successful in solving the talent challenges for their specific organization, or as we call it, we help them achieve hiring success. So because we know that the focus alone on technology itself, though being a technology platform, uh, doesn't solve everything, right? So just implementing a new ATS or just getting a, a specific tool doesn't imply becoming immediately successful in, uh, in recruitment. So what we do as smart recruiters is that we do not just focus on setting you up in our system and then hand over the car keys and say, well, good luck and uh, have fun on your journey to achieve hiring success. We work together with our customers and help them uh, achieve uh, the outcomes that we think that matter. And uh, for us, those are the three that you see on the slide there. Um, for us, that's delivering a great experience. Um, we always work on increasing the collaboration between the business and recruitment. Um, and as last, we focus on the productivity of uh, the recruiter themselves. So 
to uh, uh, um, to go a little bit into this, right? So becoming successful in recruitment for your organization, right? That's for us that it's all about. So and we all know there is a lot of different things you need to work on, usually at the same time. So how do you actually ensure all the work that you are doing to improve your TA capabilities? And how do you make sure that it all adds up to this one eventual goal? So this is why we always use the hiring success framework before we dive in. For example, with pre-boarding, we really want to understand how it fits into the, the bigger picture. And this, which you see on the slide here, that is actually that bigger picture or the hiring success framework, as we call it. So I'd like to take you quickly through it. And if we start at the bottom and bottom right specifically, this is the technology part. So this is where the entire tech stack sits, also the ATS itself. And with hiring success, we zoom out and take a look at the entire TA function over people, process, and technology. And what we actually do, we are looking for the imbalances between the three. For example, you can have a Ferrari of an ATS and tech stack with the technology like uh, Apple smart recruiters and et cetera, uh, have really good and tra uh, trained and engaged people in place. But if you don't have logical processes, when it comes to pre-boarding, for example, um, offer, offer approvals, right? I actually worked at an organization where it took five signatures to get an offer approved uh, before I could send out the contract. And it took almost a week to get there, right? So this is how you actually have a, are at risk of losing your candidates, right? Um, uh, so this is a small example of an imbalance that we take a look at. If we go one layer higher, we call this the pillars of hiring success. Easy as explained, you take the entire recruitment function or TA function, you cut it in three pieces. The first piece, talent attraction and engagement, everything top funnel, roughly till the application, collaboration and selection, is how do we grab hang by the ankle, pull him down through the, through the, through the funnel, giving him a great experience, not losing Hank, and how do we actually know uh, we are taking the right hiring decision? Is Hank actually the best candidate in the pipeline or the best candidate we can find? And also, of course, pre-boarding and onboarding is also in this, uh, in this part of uh, the process. And last, we have the management and operating model. And this is everything. How are you organized as TA function? How do you measure your own success? And how do you make sure you enter this loop of continuous improvement? So all the work that we do, including work on pre-boarding, all the work that we do as hiring success happens in this layer. Right, And then if you look at the last layer, so the three pieces of uh, the pillars, right? So where do we work as hiring success and where does uh, pre-boarding pre fit? Um, if we decide to work on something and how do we prioritize our work, we always go back to the principles or the outcomes to say it like that, right? So all the work that we do on your pre-boarding as well needs to contribute to at least one or more of those outcomes on the top, right? It should help increase your candidate experience. It should help and could help your collaboration between the business and, and recruitment. So as we say, engaged hiring managers. So how do you really make that connection with new hires in that period? Uh, and the last part is empowered recruiters. So how do recruiters actually, uh, how do you help recruiters being better at their jobs? To say it like that, right? So automation and digitalization in this process. So this is how we usually work and approach. So this is literally the first step that we take when we uh, uh, are talking to customers to maybe work on their uh, pre-boarding process. Um, and for us, it's all about that ability to attract, select, and hire the best talent for any role on demand and on budget. For us, this is what you should strive for as a TA function. And everything that you want to improve within your TA function uh, uh, should contribute to this goal. So also pre-boarding. So if we go to the next slide, pre-boarding. So how do we approach this from a hiring success perspective, right? If we work with uh, customers on, uh, uh, on different cases, we do see that this is a great opportunity, uh, area of opportunity uh, to drive big change and impact, right? Because we see uh, a lot of automation uh, opportunities here. A lot of processes are usually manual or there is a lot of emailing or data communication going on between different departments. Um, and of course, pre-boarding, as we said in the beginning as well, has a very high impact on the candidate experience and uh, how, how the candidate actually perceives their new job, their new colleagues and the new organization. But in our experience, it's also a difficult field uh, to drive change in sometimes from a TA perspective. And this has all to do with the uh, uh, circle of influence, right? If you want to work on your CRM strategy, it's all within your own confines of your TA department or your job advertising, et cetera. But 
we do see if you're going to work on pre-boarding, uh, there are a lot in, in a lot of times multiple departments and disciplines involved, right? You have to work with HR business partners, HR administration, HR IT, or your IT department. Um, they're all they're all involved, right? So it's really important um, if you start working or want to do some work in pre-boarding, is do a proper stakeholder analysis, right? So build your project team first because you need to have everyone on board there. And of course, as I said, the high degree of complexity. Um, this is usually the first part. If you start hiring somebody, systems need to start talking to each other, right? So an ATS can create an offer. You need to do your offer approvals. You need to create an offer. You need to create a contract. You need to create, get all the paperwork in order, get all the right addendums with the contract. Somebody gets a bonus, gets a lease car, whatnot, right? So there are a lot of uh, different systems and data going on there. So it could be somewhat tricky because it can get complex. And the last thing what we notice if we work with customers, it's also good to keep that in mind, is that taking decisions on optimizing your, uh, uh, your pre-boarding process, there are two things, two big pillars that you need to take into account. And the first one is, how does it affect the candidate experience? Two, how does it affect our internal processes? And sometimes the, the, these decisions can be contradicting, right? So we can do something that is really good for the candidate, What's more offered, offer uh, effort and work for us or the other way around. So you need to be aware of this, that you, every decision that knife cuts on has a, a, a double edged sword, right? So that knife cuts on two sides in that perspective and every decision that you make. So if we go, what I wanted to talk to you about, I have a few examples on what, uh, 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 what we come across some best practices and, uh, and so, but before we dive into that, uh, this is an exercise that we actually do with our customers first. We ask them, what is the benefit of pre-boarding, right? So from a TA perspective, we can come up with these three relatively fast. I don't think I need to talk to you all uh, about this, why, why this is the reason why we should invest in pre-boarding, right? So uh, you don't want to lose your candidate uh, on, until optimizing that candidate experience and towards automation and speed. But... If you need, uh, as I said in the beginning, you have different stakeholders to, 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 to involve here, right? So you need your IT department, for example, in digitalizing your processes or uh, adding some other technologies. And if you go to your IT department and say, we need to do this and we need to invest money to optimize the candidate experience, it's like it, it doesn't always connect with them because from their perspective, what is their job? They need to manage the entire tech stack of the organization. And from their perspective, they need to make sure it... It is easy and not too expensive to manage all that. So you need to go into the perspective of all your stakeholders, right? So what we have done in this exercise, for example, with a customer is that we connect what we want to do and what our in initial drivers are to change uh, and, and work on pre-boarding. We connect them to business outcomes. And for us, the first one, so don't lose your candidate, right? So because if you lose your candidate in, in the pre-boarding phase, Literally all the work you've done is for nothing because you have to start over. You have to find a new candidate. And that affects on a business outcome, your hiring velocity. And for us, the hiring velocity is your ability to deliver people on time when the business needs them. This is what we call hiring, hiring velocity. So if you lose people in your, in your pre-boarding process, the effect on the business is that you are not always able to deliver on time or get a candidate too late or fill a position too late. And if we go back to that optimizing the candidate experience, uh, we talk to your IT and finance department, we need to invest to uh, improve the experience. Why? Right? The business outcome behind it for us is what we call the net hiring score, NHS. So that's the quality of the hire and it drives retention. Right? Hank already gave the numbers, well, how, how, how pre-boarding and onboarding can drive that retention. So we need, and now you see how you can change the conversation from Yes, we do to increase the experience. But if I'm talking to my finance, uh, finance director to get the budget uh, uh, true, I say, I need to invest because it will improve the quality of hire and it will drive retention. So we lose less people in the first 60, 90 days or even year. That's a case you can build upon. And again, the last one also for automation and speed. For us as TA, yes, we want to save uh, time and manual labor in creating contracts and getting everything right. can be a headache sometimes. But for the business outcome, uh, everything around automation and speed, you need to translate in cost savings, right? So what is the actual saving for the business? And I would like to go and dive into all three of these areas. I have a few examples of customers we've worked with. 
just to get your juices flowing and how can I build this business case for, for me internally um, uh, and start working on your pre and onboarding process. So if we go to all around that hiring philosophy, your ability to deliver on time, right? Counter offers. I am always surprised talking to TA teams around the world asking, is it a standard procedure to talk about counter offers with all your candidates? It should be, but it isn't in most cases, right? Uh, and we know that 80% of high potentials report receiving a counter offer. Around 15% of them ish, depending on the branch, of course, and the type of role, 15% accept counter offers. But we also know that the biggest chunk of that 15% is going to look for a job again in 12 months because usually a counter offer includes maybe a promotion and financial benefits, but those are usually not the primary drivers for people to look outside of their uh, uh, own employment in the first place. So you see that they will come back to market. But the thing is, you always just you need to talk to your people about this. Ask them about it. Do you expect a counter offer? And why were, you, why were you applying with our organization in the first place? You need to understand those drivers so you can help somebody navigate the process of receiving a counter offer and taking the right decision. Um, so this is something we usually really suggest every recruiter should do uh, right, off the, right off the bat because you can do this from day one. You don't need technology. It's not complex to integrate it, but it will drive and improve your pre-boarding and uh, retention uh, uh, a lot. And the second one, hypercare. We at recruitment are super good at process management, right? So what we do is we hire, we go everything to the flow and uh, Frank says yes. And then yes, on to the next role. And uh, uh, we, keep, we keep recruiting for new roles. But we forget that we don't usually do anything around hypercare, right? Because we need to realize if somebody says yes, then the emotional process is going to start. Okay, I have said yes, but I have to say goodbye from my trusted employee, Microsoft, and all those familiar faces and something I know to dive into the deep at an, uh, with your organization with a new role and you don't know exactly what's going to happen, which is exciting though, but it's an emotional process. So talk about this with your candidates as well. Have you resigned? How are you going to resign? Have you uh, uh, have you talked about this with your with your friends and family already? Is usually a really good uh, uh, how do you say that indicator, or you are at risk of losing a candidate. I actually always ask my candidates, uh, what was the reaction of your friends and family for your new job? If somebody hasn't told them yet, after they said yes and you've sent them the contract, you probably need to spend some more time with this candidate to make sure uh, you don't lose him because something is up. Because then you want to scream it off the roof if you have a new job and you are actually going, right? And the last thing is if you are talking about that hiring velocity, you, uh, your ability to deliver on time, is that you need to realize that not fill position costs money and time, right? So what you see is that uh, uh, you need to realize that there's also a double-edged sword, right? So you yes, you need to go back into your, uh, yeah, hopefully you have somebody in an interview stage that you can, continue and move forward, but sometimes you really have to start over for some roles. But this all, all this time spent, you cannot spend on other roles as well. So there is a big invisible uh, cost center there if people actually, uh, if you lose them to, uh, do, during the pre-boarding process, to say it like that. If you look at the quality of hire and retention, my slide wants to go forward. Yes, it does. There we go. Um, First things, everyone is super excited when they have a new job, right? And I think it was mentioned at the table before as well. People are uh, really open to learn uh, about the new position and organization and et cetera. And in the pre-boarding phase, you can literally have a really big influence in how fast people are productive. Because again, we know this links to how uh, uh, to better retention numbers and how people feel about their new employer. And we actually have an example of working with an Indian insurance company. They um, they worked uh, 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 for the sales positions it was. They hired big volumes there. They had a five-day onboarding. And actually what they did is push uh, uh, some of that pre-onboarding uh, lessons into the pre-boarding process during the notice period, shortening the onboarding process after the start to only two days. And within the first six months, all new starters, on average, had an increase of 35% of lead generation in the first month by literally sharing information during the pre-boarding process because people want, are more perceptive to it. So 
thinking about this is not only about the candidate experience, but there is a real big financial benefit in uh, for an organization for some type of roles. And think about production employees, think about uh, retail, think about all those type of roles that it really is useful to do e-learning and, and, and pre-learning uh, before people start so they can hit the floor running, right? And the second one, jumpstart team connections, right? That emotional phase of uh, resigning from your job and making it into reality that that new job is going to happen. You, what you can do is let your team invite this person on LinkedIn already. Make it so. Congratulate people, etc. And what we, we work with Twitter, and what Twitter actually does is that they have, uh, every end of the month, they have like a, a happy hour with the senior leadership team for all new uh, uh, pre-boarding people to meet the board and ask them questions and have some interaction there because the board wants to show you matter and you are super important. So every month we take the time to talk and invest and get to know you and not just uh, uh, on a general, we'll, we'll inform you at the town hall because it's easy and it'll make your new people really, really important. The second thing that they do is that uh, um, hiring managers are obligated to invite people after they said yes, at least one time for coffee or lunch. Of course, now with social distancing uh, <laughs> due to COVID situation, but they, 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 they made it mandatory for hiring managers. So putting that role of the hiring manager more important in, uh, uh, in that pre-boarding process to keep driving uh, and building that relationship with that person that is in exciting phase, right? In that pre-boarding. And I think last, again, it also is that, um, uh, and we said it, right? So that retention is connected to how well you do your pre-boarding. And if you start working on this, the last one, so people leaving in the first year, um, there is usually a connection between a fit to the job, to the team or the organization. And you need to make sure that at least from a talent acquisition perspective, you do as much as you can to positively influence this, right? So it's it's you can, what you can do here is take a look at how many people left in the first 90 days or a year last year when you introduce a new uh, uh, new optimized pre-boarding process and compare these metrics to see are you actually uh, influencing this in the into the right direction. And last, let me see, cost savings. Yes. So manual work is a thing that we encounter with a lot of organization when it comes to pre-boarding, creating contracts, get all the documents in place. So Due to this high degree of complexity, there is an incredible opportunity for cost savings. And there was a research of General Electric. This is, of course, a really big organization. And they did a project only focusing on eliminating the manual work during the pre-boarding process. So nothing, nothing fancy, nothing on the candidate experience, just eliminating and automating that, uh, uh, that manual uh, labor, right? And that saved them $3.7 million in the first year. And this is rolling cost going on because you, uh, you, you eliminated it going forward, right? So there, are, there is a big opportunity there. And to make it a little bit smaller and closer to home, the second one, uh, getting the first time right. So reduction of errors. When contracts come true, is everything right the first time? Because everything that you, every time that you spend on correcting and changing documents and etc., is waste. So that is time that you should not spend, right? So everything is run first time right. And when I worked at Vacom, when I came in there, uh, when uh, somebody said yes to an offer, I had to walk over to a, to a closet, get a printed paper out, fill this in by pen, put it one slot lower back in. And it took 48 hours and I get a package of a contract with two or three centimeters thick, boom, on my desk. And it was always at least one typo or a position title that wasn't correct or it always needed to be corrected. Then it went back to the desk of the HR admin and it took one to two days again before it got back on my desk until it was perfect. Then we sent it out by post. So it took two days before it got to the candidate. So it took on average seven to nine days until we got the contract in the hands of, of the candidate. And then not even speak to how fast it takes to manually fill it out, send it back, and administer it back into the system. But from a candidate perspective, there, there, there's sometimes a week or more between somebody saying yes and actually receiving their contract before making it real, right? So it's really important to, to see what you can improve there. And I set out on a journey of two years, two years improving the pre-boarding process, but Wakeup is now at a place that, again, if Hank says yes to, uh, to a role there, uh, the recruiter can 
uh, approve the contract, sign the contract, have the right addendums there, uh, uh, and send it out all digital between five and seven minutes for all roles. It's a really long journey and everything in the pre-boarding had to be redone from actually completely rewriting and restructuring our contracts and throw everything. It was a pain that process, but for now, for forever, it only takes five to seven minutes to send out a contract. So this is an example of on what I worked on uh, uh, myself there. Um, just not for the cost, but also for the annoyance and communication between TA, TA, HR back office and all those internal processes, everything went away. So there was a really big win there. And because as the last point I mentioned here as well, what is a really good thing to measure is find the relationship between the time that somebody says yes and uh, that you have all the paperwork done so that you finish your pre-boarding. Is there a relationship between uh, people leaving as well? And if you improve it, compare time over time. So for working on the pre-boarding process, I would always say the time is now. There isn't any time as today to say it like that, to start working on your uh, processes, uh, uh, tech stack and candidate experience and build that pre-boarding process, which you want, because it's always a longer journey. But I would always suggest, please uh, take, take a look at it today or start thinking about it today and keep in mind to connect what you, uh, what you want to achieve from a talent acquisition perspective, make sure that you connect that to what is the benefit for the business, right? We all live and breathe. Yes, we need to improve the candidate experience, but that doesn't always resonate automatically with IT, HR, and finance. So I would say that is my most important takeaway there um, from this story. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to this, right? We are not just managing, uh, optimizing the cost center. We are the difference makers as TA, uh, and we're making great measurable impact on the business. We do not just fill vacancies, right? We build teams and culture person by person. This is what we do because at the end of the day, you are who you hire. That's it. Back to you. So a big applause to you. Now, great to hear your story. It makes me actually curious to find out uh, how you organized the pre-boarding at Smart Recruiting. Did you have something in place for that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yes, we do. Um, um, we do really believe in best uh, best of breed, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, from from a technological perspective, what we do, we we in the ATS, we we uh, make sure you have your complete approval chain. So it's like this to approve offers, so you can move fast and everything you can do by mobile. And on the other hand, we have an open API because there is beautiful technology like uh, Epical, DocuSign, et cetera, to, uh, to help and assist in these processes. So yes, we have a direct integration with, uh, for example, Epical and, uh, and DocuSign so that the recruiter can do everything from one system and create everything. Yeah. And uh, Peter, and did you hear anything uh, from Tony that you <sighs> want to include in your pre-hiring and pre-boarding? Um, well, process? good question. Multiple <laughs> things, to be honest, uh, Tony. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very, you shared a lot. <laughs> yeah, very inspiring story. Um, yeah. um, I, I think the key takeaways for me were like um, to put more notice on the, um, the, the hypercare and the, and the emotional process a new hire uh, goes through. Um, because uh, everything that happens in a candidate journey is, is great, but it's still you know, not for real. You're, you're in most cases, uh, still at a safe place if you have a job. Uh, when you say yes to the desk and you are entering the pre-boarding phase, it really is happening. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very important phase for that hire. So hypercare, I, I, I really like that word, Tony, thanks. Uh, but also involving different stakeholders, right? That is what we see at Epoch as well. Like I said to ask uh, uh, Hank before, it's not only the hiring manager, TA, it's not only the, uh, the HR department, there are different people that, that are involved. So, so set up your project group um, um, also to, to create great success with, within your pre-boarding phase. It's very important. So, and more things. So, Tony, thanks for sharing. Yeah, thank you, Tony, so much. Welcome. Now, Peter, um, you're not going to give a presentation. Um, but I want to take some time with you to discuss uh, pre-boarding at Apple. So, um, do you see a difference in companies' usage of the Apple platform in the pre-boarding phase in this current climate? <coughs> um, ah, very uh, boring answer, but yes and no. No. <laughs> um, 
But good to know before Corona, before this pandemic, right? The pre-boarding phase, like uh, discussed earlier, uh, was mainly happening um, um, online, digital. Uh, and I think if you look at all our customers, I would say 90, 95% is using Epical, uh, not only in the onboarding, but also in the pre-boarding phase. Um, and that was also before the, for the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what we do see is that uh, where before the Corona uh, uh, came, um, the onboarding phase was, was ba basically blended learning, right? Uh, On-site, face-to-face sessions, coffee drink uh, meetings, uh, where it is now, well, 60, 65% based also uh, on, the, on the data, uh, still online, right? So Epoch was being used basically for a longer time. So after pre-boarding, you have the, the first day, what typically is uh, a happy day at the office, which is now still an online meeting uh, in, in most cases. So, so Epoch, I, th I think the user adoption of Epoch is longer mm -hmm. um, and the intensity is still the same. Yeah. yeah. And do you have examples of companies that have a good pre-boarding in place and why is that so strong? <sighs> Shall I now mention our own? No, it's, it's, not, it's, not, <laughs> the, it's not the best. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, yeah, of course, I have, I have a few examples. Um, to begin with, um, I think um, set expectations, right, is very important, mm -hmm. right? So don't overwhelm them with information that is not relevant yet. Right? Yeah. Um, the long-term strategy, um, um, what systems they are about to use is maybe not the most important content to share. What is important, I, I think it's, you can, com you can uh, summarize it in three topics. Um, we mentioned the first already, like uh, keep engagement high, right? So, so keep fueling them with, uh, with stuff that, that, that keep them uh, excited. Uh, so they will share about uh, uh, their new job with their family and friends, like, uh, like Tony said. Mm. Um, that's the first part that you definitely should cover in the pre-boarding phase. The second part is, is, is very practical, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, pre-corona, um, what is the dress code? Well, is there lunch? Where can I park? How can I find my office? It was a hell of a job to find this place, by the way. So um, everything <laughs> really? you can cover in, in the pre-boarding <laughs> phase with, with Google, yeah, <laughs> Google Maps or, or, or Google sorry. Street View is very, uh, very, very important, so very practical. Yeah. Um, and the third one, that is something that is, that is becoming more and more important because the first two are, are covered by most of our customers, at least, is um, job clarity, right? Mm -hmm. So there's research that 63% uh, is struggling with um, lack of job clarity, right? So me as a salesperson, how can I add value to the company? It's different than, than a data analyst or, or HR professional for that matter. Um, and everybody wants to, 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 to show impact uh, and create impact right away. So provide job clarity to a person specifically is very important to do before they won, mm -hmm. uh, so he or she will not be lost in, uh, in the company uh, after they won. Yeah. yeah. And what would you recommend companies not to do in their pre-boarding? <coughs> um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, it, it's, it's similar to what I just said. Uh, partly, I, I think it's important to not share information that is not relevant for them. Mm -hmm. so, so share information on a time that he or she is, is, is searching for that information. Um, so make it personal, right? Make it uh, uh, so they can resonate uh, uh, to the content that is shared to them. Um, involve uh, peers, right? Uh, make connections already. Uh, and not make it very, very general, right? Uh, a lot of stuff is shared in the Canada journey about the company culture, about um, the office, but make it more personal. And if you don't do that, the, the engagement level might drop, and that mm -hmm. is something you definitely don't want. Yeah, and why is pre-boarding so important for um, the new hires? Uh, I think it's the phase where you can, I wouldn't say make or break uh, <laughs> the success of a, a new hire, but it's, I think, the most important part, right? Um, uh, we, we say turn your talent into heroes, right? Uh, we all hire talent, and like uh, Tony said, uh, when you find your talent, you spend a lot of time, resources, and money uh, to do that. Uh, turn them into heroes, like we uh, like to call it, or ambassadors, mm -hmm. and that, that can start right after they said yes, right? Uh, so um, show them how they can, can add value, right? And give examples of, of maybe people that left the company that are still an ambassador, right? Give them tips and tricks how to, to be successful. Make it very personal. Um, so I think that phase is, is maybe even the most important phase in the whole journey. Yeah. yeah. And how do you make contact with the new hires during pre-boarding? By, by using Epco, of course, but yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I can uh, give a, a nice example. He's uh, a real salesperson, <laughs> eh? <laughs> uh, I can uh, give a nice example. I just spoke to, to one of my colleagues, Eric Jan, who is yeah. leading uh, our, our team of customer onboarding uh, yeah. consultants. Uh, and I asked the same question, right? right? How do we use Epco to make a connection to, uh, to new hires? Mm. Um, 
because it's technology, right? It's not face to face. Yeah. And he said, G give them an, uh, an, um, an assignment. For instance, within Epical, we just hired a new colleague uh, called Rose. Rose, welcome to the team. Um, and one of our assignments was um, map out the customer journey, right? So map out the customer journey of Epical. Uh, and these are people that might give you some tips and tricks. Mm -hmm. right? You can find them on LinkedIn, you can uh, WhatsApp them, or uh, using Epical, of course, to reach out um, and ask them. What is your part in the journey? Uh, what do we miss? What can, I, what can I add? And at the end of her probation time, she presented the customer journey from her perspective, mm -hmm. right? Super uh, uh, useful for us as a company that's already, you know, uh, having that tunnel vision uh, maybe. Uh, and it's very useful for her to, to reach out to people with a goal instead of, hi, I'm Rose, uh, shall we have a cup of coffee? No, I have some questions for you. Yeah. Uh, and everybody, at, at least at Epico, is always willing to talk about their role, right? Yeah. People like to, uh, to share their own uh, uh, added value to the company. Yeah. So yeah. that's great. And how, how do you do that in, at Microsoft? Well, at Microsoft, we, um, uh, of course, have a lot of systems and uh, tooling in place to, uh, to uh, welcome people. So, of course, there's uh, the, 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 the digital onboarding. Mm -hmm. There's already information uh, available uh, about what's possible. But it's fair to say, if, if I have to think back about my best onboarding experience, it was in my previous employer, also mm -hmm. part of Microsoft LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Um, because they did basically tell me what you what you were advocating. So I was having the first interview with the recruiter uh, that had not grilled me, but just did the interview to mm. check, hey, are you a fit, yes mm -hmm. or no? But from the moment she called me back, uh, stating, Hank, I'm going to um, provide a positive advice for you to, to the hiring manager and the rest of the teams, and from this moment on, I'm your buddy. So she did a constant weekly nice. check-in. Yeah, yeah. Every week I did get a call uh, yeah. to check in on, hey, what did you hear? What happened? Hey, your next interview is coming up. Then, of course, the third interview was presenting a business case. And mm -hmm. she was literally preparing with me. Are you ready? Do you understand it? Do I need to challenge people in the organization? Yeah. Uh, and she was literally on my side. Yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, listening to Chris and also to Tony, the, the, the most simple thing with onboarding is I want to experience that I'm not a number, but a person. Yeah. And making me a person has to do with respect. Yeah. And the second thing I learned from social media, yes. it's, it's not about doing things perfect, it's, it's about how you correct mistakes. Yeah. And so if you look at the most impactful cases at, um, uh, in social media, it's always about organizations correcting a mistake instead mm -hmm. of uh, the mistake itself. It's not... We, we are used to making mistakes, mm -hmm. right? So, where I really love the storytelling from Tony about, hey, don't make sure it's taking too long to get a contract in place. At the same time, the yeah. likability, the more I understand that there are real people behind the, head, the, the desk on the other side that yeah. are having the best intention and mm -hmm. showing to me that they're having it, I don't care if they make a mistake uh, yeah. because it make me, makes me part of the whole process. Yeah. But if I'm experienced as a number, I think yeah. that's where it's go wrong. Yeah. yeah. And Peter, if you yeah. use a pre-boarding platform, don't you lose the personal touch, the contact with the new hires? Uh, no, I, I, think, I think the opposite. That's a very fair question, by the way. We, we okay. received that question from our customers um, <laughs> before the sale many times. Uh, involving technology in this phase um, uh, is... Oh, sorry. It's, it's maybe not... Um, yeah. No, just um, continue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's maybe not increasing the personal touch, and nowadays that is more important. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it can uh, go hand in hand, right? So, yes, it, it automates the process, it streamlines the process, but I, can, I, I think it can even uh, boost the experience, for instance, by um, involving testimonials in the technology, right? If you ask your, again, your existing employees to, to record a, a one-minute video of his role and his experience at Apple, mm. and that video is being uh, broadcasted through the app in the pre-boarding phase, um, telling about the do's and the don'ts. Uh, an example, uh, I think in every company, uh, sales and, for instance, uh, um, the operation sometimes, um, uh, well, have some challenges working together. Uh, sales is selling A, and the operation, uh, uh, well, needs to sometimes fix promises that are uh, uh, um, uh, maybe a little bit um, difficult to fix. Um, but if you share that, that struggle or that challenge you have inside in the company, and you can say, this is where we need you to, to maybe help us become better, right? Um, that makes it very personal. And then, and then ask, how would you contribute? Uh, do you have some tips from your previous experience from uh, Wacomp or uh, LinkedIn? Uh, it's super personal, uh, and you use technology. So I, I think it can go hand in hand. Yeah, and Hank, um, how difficult is to make a connection with the new hires remotely? From? From the new hires remotely. 
In all fairness, I don't think it's hard at all. Uh, no. no, we're already we're already for for over 20 years in a phase where social media is active. We're used to WhatsApp, etc., etc., etc. I think where things are going wrong is if I will use an onboarding platform like Epical to automate mm -hmm. uh, what I'm going to do with my new hire. So basically, I want to say, hey. Uh, I want to welcome you, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'm not personally involved. It's just a set of recordings. Mm -hmm. I think that's where it's going wrong. Yeah. So going back to my uh, to my best experiences at Microsoft, I got a buddy ex uh, assigned from the moment I got hired. Yeah. Uh, my manager introduced me to, hey Hank, this is Brenda. She will be your uh, onboarding buddy from uh, from the moment you start, but hey, feel free to reach out. Mm -hmm. And instead of me reaching out, she was immediately on top of it. And she is still uh, checking in with me on a weekly basis. But the fact that we were already connecting before I started, that's where it starts. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, if a buddy is telling you, hey, uh, Hank, in the preface, you can go to this platform and already start reading A, B, C. Mm -hmm. And this person is telling me, not only it's already made available, hey, but hey, in all documentation, zoom in on that because... Yeah. And then she is explaining to me why it's important. I think that's the whole experience. Yeah. So in all fairness, had the questions about is a digital platform uh, not not creating more distance? At, at, at in all in not all fairness, all. I, I honestly feel almost like um, I'm saying it out loud. But that those are bullshit questions. Yeah. Mm. The question is, am I capable to use digital environments mm. in yeah. a way that I still show personal interest? Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And I can do that digitally. Yeah. Do I prefer face to face? Of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Me too. Now. You are the only one that didn't have, a, didn't get an applause yet. So <laughs> <laughs> don't eat it. You still get an applause. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for your, for answering me. Now, great. We're going to finalize this discussion and have some more questions from the audience that were asked during today's session. But first, we're gonna um, look at the results of today's poll, and they're gonna appear here on the iPad. And I have to say, I'm normally having. Reading glasses. <laughs> Yesterday I was trying to read them and I had really difficulties, but now I'm just going to use my glasses. This is much easier for me. Let me see. <laughs> the question is don't laugh. No, no nothing wrong with you. No, 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 it looks good. It looks good. Um, you look good. When does pre boarding start at your organization? Hmm. Um, you could choose from the moment a candidate is hired, you have 37%. When the contract is signed, that is 32%. A couple of weeks before day one, that's 18%, and a week or less before day one, that's 12%. So feel free to answer, have to, to respond. So, Tony? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really diverse answer, right? Isn't it? Mm -hmm. To be very honest, if I see uh, those numbers. So it's uh, interesting to see that we uh, maybe have to work a little bit better as a uh, TA industry to... Uh, help with this definition, right? Yeah. yeah, because I don't think, uh, I, please let me know if you guys agree with me, but for me, there is no other definition than from the moment the person said yes, right? There is no reason to start later with pre-boarding in my eyes, but I don't know how you, uh, how you see that. I yeah. would be a little bit more careful um, b b because hey, it's, it's depending on how do I interpret the question. So I think the first and, and most important yeah. thing is don't do things that are not a fit with your culture. So, um, again, when working on LinkedIn, I've been working a lot on employer branding, and the biggest risk is that you start branding something that you are not actually in mm. reality. Mm. So, if you're just a very uh, sober Dutch organization, and uh, hey, don't bullshit here, and uh, let's act normal, yeah. I can fully understand why you start a few weeks before. And then the only question is, can we, for example, prove in already assigning a buddy, or making sure that the team starts reaching out? Mm. Um, so... I think it's very important to make sure that what you do aligns with the reality that I will experience when I join the company. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I fully agree. That's a, that's a very, by the way, a very interesting point. So, sorry, sorry, right? I, I really like your point. And this is what I think it's on, the, um, how do you say that? On what you need to do needs to fit who you are. Yes, 100%. Um, but this is interesting on the definition because my definition would also be that paperwork right so how do you get that offer in how do you get the contracts in etc which is a little bit more on the process so it's not indeed immediately push somebody with uh content and all uh fancy stuff if it doesn't fit you as an organization right so yeah i, I do agree with you but it's an interesting part that we um you see that there is some flexibility in the definition here 
still. Yeah. Well, I think the 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 the, the first answer was um, after signing the contract. I think, uh, and I. Uh, the moment a candidate yeah. is hired. I, I agree with Second that. Second one I is think, when the contract yeah, is signed. When that's they preferred, said, right? Yeah, that's yeah. preferred. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also agree with Hank that, that this phase is super important, but it can also, of course, um, um, uh, come with a risk. If you uh, tell a story or a promise that is not what is happening, and, and after day one they will, they will experience a different um, reality, mm -hmm. it will backfire hard. So um, do it good, or maybe even do it not. But uh, I, I would definitely say uh, <laughs> invest in pre-boarding. You should um, do it. Yeah, of course, but do it, do it in the right way, right? Otherwise it will backfire. But I agree with, uh, with, the, with the answer after, after they sign the contract, or well, in my opinion. Yeah. I have a lot of questions coming in, actually, for cool. you guys, so that's nice. Cool. I have a question for Hank, and this question comes from René. How does the feedback cycle work? Meaning, how soon does all your data translate to actions within the organization? Uh, that's a very good question, uh, René. So, um, uh, within the tool, we, from activating the tool, we on average can make sure that uh, within two weeks you have full data. So of course we need to go through a cycle to set up with the organization had uh, the workplace analytics. Mm -hmm. But if we talk about what I would call a vanilla approach, mm -hmm. uh, then you will have within two weeks a dashboard mm -hmm. where you can uh, start looking at um, the most important data points. And most important data points are already about uh, basically what I was showing on that slide. Uh, uh, hey, you can analyze when a new hire is meeting the team, mm -hmm. when are they meeting the manager, how structured do they have one-on-ones, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> at the same time, and, and I think that's, uh, but, but then again, that's the, the, the data freak inside of me. What I like <laughs> a lot is we created the dashboard where we say there's a lot of data to discover, and we created the dashboard that is making it possible to analyze from the start what's happening on, on the most important KPIs with with regards to onboarding, with regards to um, uh, uh, team effectiveness, with regards to low quality meetings, blah, blah, blah. But every data point is exportable to either Excel or to uh, Power BI. Uh, and then I can start playing around with it and uh, do my own crunching and start looking at the data from my own angle or mm -hmm. start digging deeper based on the first analysis. Yeah. So Renee, hope that kind of uh, addresses your question. So from our side, we can we can activate it within two weeks, and yeah. after activation, you can look back immediately for 12 to 13 months. Mm -hmm. That's bringing me to another cool remark. If you want to compare pre-COVID-19 with COVID-19 data, of course, time is kind of running out. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So that's. Uh, and question: Would you say that uh, the tool is more made made for HR people or data analytic people? Because well, I think you're both. But <laughs> who would be your and you no, it's 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 resonating with with quite a lot of people. So mm. uh, is it is it an, uh, an um, um, is it logical to be interested in this from HR? The answer is one hundred percent yes. Yeah. Um, and I think that the most powerful reason is it's providing you with tons of data sure. to support Decisions. your strategy, yeah. Uh, yeah. your board, etc. The second uh, part of the organization that is highly interested is IT. Yeah. IT is very focused on, hey, we're providing us, hey, you with all kinds of tools to become productive. Yeah. And instead of just zooming in on what's the contribution of the tool, we can now zoom in on what's the contribution of working behavior and how yeah. can we improve that. Yeah. So you will see that we uh, that we will develop much more uh, tooling within teams, etc., yeah. to focus on that. So yeah. we will start working in providing you commute time. So yeah. instead of, hey, yeah. normally we would step into the car, go home, check yeah. out. Yeah. Now I'm stepping out of my sleeping room, eh, bedroom <laughs> where I work uh, <laughs> downstairs. So that's taking me one minute to jump into the family life. <laughs> but we will we will help you in in planning some commute time and focus on checking out with some mindfulness uh, stuff, etc. But again, analytics is key, so we will provide you with a lot of information. Yeah. I think it's funny because you say HR and, and IT. Uh, again, three, four years ago, Epical was a definitely an HR tool, mm -hmm. um, the only stakeholder we had. Currently, it's almost becoming more an IT tool, right? Uh, it is integrated with different tools, like, like Tony said, for instance, with smart recruiters, we have an API integration, but it is not standing alone anymore, right? So and to, to combine data from different tools and, and, and um, provide HR, the board, with, um, with data so they can make better decisions, it, it is, I think it's, uh, it's, it's fundamental, right? So to integrate with different tools, and then IT is a stakeholder, is... Um, that's fair to say it's wider. So yep. we, what we currently see that's the most recent trend is that organizations start thinking about, okay, we're still in lockdown, but there's this moment where, we, where we're where going back to work, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, good news on vaccines mm -hmm. yesterday. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
stock up, boom, yeah. um, uh, which was nice. Um, um, <laughs> going back to the topic. Off topic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but what we see is that organizations now realize, hey, uh, people will not go fully back to the office if, no. if they can work from home as well. So they will go in a more hybrid mode, right? Mm -hmm. And if you then do a large outlook, that basically means, hey, I have now uh, quite some investments in real estate or in renting uh, office yeah, yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. How much office space do yeah. I need in the future? And yeah. what if I can reduce my office space with 20, 30%? Yeah. That's talking about a lot of money. So we also see that there's interest coming from facilities and from uh, real estate departments. Check. And then last but not least, um, uh, sales is really interested nowadays in, hey, we are now working with our clients completely remotely. Mm -hmm. Are we doing it the right way? Yeah. Uh, how much yeah. time are we spending on clients? Are we spending time with clients on the right levels? Yeah. Uh, do we spend the most time with the clients that deserve it based on revenue or are we spending the most of our time with very small clients? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we all know the old mistakes from, from uh, let's say, a few months back, but it's happening digitally still. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. why the interest? Very. I have a question here for Tony. Uh, how do you fit bias-free hiring into your model and when still depending on the selection capabilities of hiring managers and all recruiters, the experience that often mistakes are made. You hire people who are like you or who you like. <laughs> this question is from Jorrit. Good luck, Tony. Did you get it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 I got it, I got it. Yeah, I think um, I'm, I'm looking for the direct angle to 100% pre-boarding, but I think it's a very interesting and very active, uh, uh, how do you say that? Um, real topic today, right? So. Um, how we do that in our product is um, the solution is never 100% technological. There is one solution to become unbiased in decision making, right? Again, you need to zoom out and take a look at people, process, and technology. And from a technology perspective, so how do we help and drive uh, becoming more unbiased in decision making is that we, for example, work with scorecards. So we define, we have the possibility to define uh, if you open a job, what are actually the competencies or behaviors somebody needs to have uh, to become successful in this role? You start interviewing on that rather than just tell me what you've done the last 10 years. So this helps with structured interviewing. And what we then do is if you score candidates against these scorecards, we even have the possibility to anonymize, how do you say that? To make the results invisible. So if I already put my results in and I'm the manager of the team and Hank is in my team and he needs to fill out. And then he says, oh, Tony thinks this, my manager thinks this candidate is amazing. Okay, I'll give it one more star as well. So we have the possibility to make this invisible. So Hank has to uh, give his honest opinion, what he thinks. And after he has submitted, he can take a look at the results of the rest of the, uh, of the interview team. So this helps, but again, it's around how technology in this example, can help becoming more unbiased and more neutral, but it's also around how do you train your people around this and awareness and what type of questions do you actually ask and what do you look for and how do you build your processes around that to help uh, uh, as well. So it's a more holistic approach, but I hope this answers a little bit on the how do we technically enable uh, uh, becoming more unbiased in decision making. Yeah, thank you. Question from Evelyn to for Peter. What's the best feedback you ever received from a customer on the Apple app? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Well, that's Evelyn a much easier question than the question to Tony, right? <laughs> What's the Maybe. best feedback? <laughs> wow, okay. Um, so, uh, that, that's, that's, well. Um, well, I, I think um, that, that it's twofold. Uh, we receive a lot of feedback around, and we spoke about it today, um, the, um, the time and the money that, that was saved by using Apple, mm -hmm. um, And that was also the reason why we start building this return on investment calculator, right? Um, and I think Tony covered it uh, extensively. Um, it is always important to save time and money. And a lot of customers, uh, for instance, ASML, I can mention them, they did a extensive research, how much time and money they saved by using Apple only in the pre-boarding phase, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and just basically to cut, off, cut out uh, manual work um, by X uh, amount of hours, multiplied by hour rate, et cetera, it's a very easy case. So that's, a, I think, a huge um, a compliment that we can save time and money. Mm -hmm. um, that also um, 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 
allows them to, to keep working with Epical. And the feedback is also, uh, in many times, around the, the user uh, feedback itself, right? So we ask the users, what do you think of this uh, application? Um, did it help you become more successful? Um, could you uh, hit the ground running? And I think the feedback of new hires is always, on average, well, don't pin me on that, but it's, it's somewhere around, somewhere between eight and nine, based on the scale of 10. I think that's a huge compliment, right? When an end user uh, um, rates your application uh, um, um, somewhere between eight and nine, uh, I think it makes us uh, a happy campers. I like yeah, to call it. I um, so, so the feedback is partly saving time and money, which mm -hmm. is important at the end of the day, to be honest, but the feedback from new hires is uh, maybe even more important. Yeah. Um, only they are not paying our, uh, <laughs> our check, but um, I think, yeah, twofold. Saving time and money and um, making the user experience great. Yeah. That's, that's, that's it, yeah. Thanks. So another question for Hank. What do you think about using colleagues over managers for the hiring, thinking from the self-organization style from Mitchell? What do you, once more? Shall I repeat you? it again? Yeah. What do you think about using colleagues over managers for the hiring, thinking from the self-organization style? Ah. That's a funny one, uh, Mitchell. I love that one. So um, um, I'm not tapping into my Microsoft experience, but the LinkedIn experience. Mm -hmm. uh, what we tend to forget as colleagues is, hey, recruiter, you're here to uh, to fill the, the hiring position and that's mm -hmm. it. And then once the recruiter starts telling me, hey, those are the three candidates, I'm going to check them on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. What is immensely stupid if you start thinking about this is that we don't prepare at all for the fact that the candidate is doing exactly the same. Yeah. So if you post a yeah. job on LinkedIn, in the LinkedIn job posting, you will already see who might be your future colleagues. Mm -hmm. So you will see literally the profiles in the job posting. Mm -hmm. But of course, every candidate starts checking out when, uh, and even before applying, who might be the recruiter I'm talking to, because yeah. I need to take that into consideration, yeah. who might be my future colleagues, who might be my future manager. And then I'm starting to look already at LinkedIn. What do I have to add? Can I make a difference here? So on one side, what are the connections? Hey, we did, uh, Tony, we did say the, the, the attend the same university or we have the same hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, hey, he is skilled in consultative selling and I'm much more skilled in the consultative part and the data crunching. So on data crunching, I can help him out. So mm -hmm. I will zoom in on that. Mm -hmm. And it's again, the moment as colleagues that you don't realize, hey, I'm going to be checked out because, hey, we have a vacancy open. That's a huge missed opportunity. Yeah. In fact, again, data, the part that sells the job best is the LinkedIn profile of the nearest colleagues and the manager. So keep that in mind. Make yeah. sure it's always Good. up to date selling the organization. Mm -hmm. Tony, let me see. I have another question for you. Um, from Jord again, uh, you mentioned smart recruiters <laughs> increases hiring managers' engagement. Can you tell us more about how you do how you do this? Well, I think that comes back to the the principle that we hold dear to say it like that. If um, how do I best explain this? I think the best way to explain it is if I talk to an organization and I ask them um, who is responsible for filling the job. Usually you get two answers. One, it's recruitment, or two, it's the business. And for me, the right answer is always the business. Because at the end of the day, the hiring manager needs to deliver something for the organization and needs to have the right team in place to do this. And if somebody leaves or is going to leave or it's just growth because a business is doing well, that hiring manager is responsible for expanding that team or growing that team or replacing someone. And recruitment is here, talent acquisition is here to help you uh, find the right person to do so. So from this principle, the hiring manager or the business is responsible to have the right people in place. Talent acquisition is here to, uh, to help and assist in finding the right people and attracting the right people. So this is for us a character trait that organizations are on the right path to hiring success, to say it like that. And um, how we then, uh, from a technical perspective, again, uh, um, uh, enable this is that we do not have a specific hiring manager portal or something like that. Everyone works in the full smart recruiter suite. So hiring managers, interviewers, everyone. So I can invite uh, Hank as an interviewer, for example. He can see the role and all the information on that person. Of course, you can set the level of access there uh, to the right levels. But we all collaborate in one system together. So 
this is uh, one of the most important things how we try to do that. So we don't do anything by email, send a resume there, et cetera. So no, everything involves around ease of use uh, to get hiring managers as involved in the process as possible. And also mobile. Mobile is something that is overlooked as well uh, in recruitment and a lot of times in terms of retail and uh, uh, operations, warehouse and distribution. It's a very powerful tool where people work and hire people, but don't really specifically have a desktop where they work, where they log into a TA suite. Hey, they need to be able to do everything on mobile, review the candidates, book in interviews, giving feedback on those interviews based on structured scorecards and all that kind of stuff. So um, mobile is also a really important pillar for us to uh, keep everyone engaged, even if they uh, are in a part of the business that they don't sit at the desk and can log into the to the suite, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Now I have another question for Peter. Um, and it's going to be also the last question because I can see in the corner of the eye that I have to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, what is your favorite example of pre-boarding and what case client from Epical stands out for you? From Frank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that, that's maybe, uh, m maybe a little bit um, um, an easy answer uh, for those who also watched uh, tuned in yesterday. Uh, um, the award for, uh, for um, uh, large enterprise uh, customers using Epico went to, uh, to PepsiCo, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the customers that, that, that I close, hold close to my heart. Uh, they use Epico not only for pre-boarding, but also mm -hmm. for onboarding. But um, I, I work closely with the team that has been working from home since March. And the team haven't been to the office since March. And they use Epico mainly now for, for the pre-boarding and, uh, and maybe the, for those who went in, uh, who tuned in yesterday, you saw the video from, from the team uh, yeah. from, from their home office. Um, they use Epico, well, in the best way possible, right? They use a lot of videos in the pre-boarding phase. They ask to connect to other people f via LinkedIn, like the examples we heard today. They share a lot of, they even have an office tour in, in, in Epico of what to expect, hopefully at some day. So yeah, they use technology, but also make it personal, like we dis discussed today, um, working from home. So yeah. I think PepsiCo uh, was a, um, well, is, is a great company uh, and a customer to have. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this was our last questions, and there is so much more to talk about and so many questions to be answered, but it's not over yet. In five minutes, you are able to join in to our networking sessions with our speakers and fellow attendees. So you will receive an invite mail in your email in any second. I want to thank all of you speakers here at the table for being here and on the, uh, on the webcam, of course, Tony. Tony from Smart Recruiters, Hank from Microsoft, and Peter from Epical. And uh, for real, as a moderator. Oh, and yes. singer, too. Yeah, you oh, did a really, you. really cool job. <laughs> yeah, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Now, meet them in the networking sessions after this and ask them questions personally. I also want to thank all the partners that made this event possible. And tomorrow, you can tune in to learn more about personal onboarding with uh, last year's Onboard Award winner, Wartel and Humanitas DMH. DMH. And the following days, will uh, cover culture onboarding, reboarding and remote onboarding. So don't forget to sign up if you haven't done so yet or you haven't bought a week pass. In the link, you can sign up. I um, know you can find the link uh, to sign up in the chat. Thank you for watching us this morning and we'll see you tomorrow at 10. Bye.